Abundance and Diversity. With this lecture, we're beginning the Community Ecology segment of Field Ecology. So let's get started. Today's objectives are to relate niches to biodiversity, we're to define the log normal distribution, what are rank abundance curves, and be able to calculate the Shannon Wiener Biodiversity Index, be able to relate soil moisture, soil fertility, and other various features of the soil and abiotic environment to biodiversity, and of course be able to define the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. This is a community ecology lecture. So Kind of the principles of community ecology, first off, a community is defined as the interacting species in a given area. We can see some flowers and some grasses here. These flowers are competing for, with each other for space. They are being pollinated by various pollinators. The pollinators are being eaten by various predators. This is the community. And community ecology is going to study the structure of a community. What that means is we're going to be looking at the richness. So how many different species are there? How abundant are there? What types of species are there? And we're going to be looking at all of this in a community sense. And communities are often made up of what we call guilds, which are organisms with similar niches. So we may have some flies, moths, bees, and various wasps, all of which may be pollinating these purple flowers here in the front of uh, Mount St. Helens. That is a guild of pollinators. Likewise, there are going to be various caterpillars, beetles, and mice, which are herbivores, and that's a guild of herbivores. These are making up the community, the various guilds present in this uh, beautiful picture. All right. So the niche specificity. Well, let's think. We're going to we're going to be dealing with issues of biodiversity. I want to relate that back to niches. So. We have this uh, complex environment, and the more complex envir the environment is, the more resources are available, you're going to get more niche partitioning because each species is going to be able to occupy a realized niche, which allows it to partition out and have a more biodiverse community if you have a more complex environment. If you just have one size of seed, then you're only really going to have one side of seed-eating beetle. But if you have multiple sizes of seeds, you have seed-eating beetles, seed-eating ants, seed-eating birds, and seed-eating mice. And this allows this, co this complex environment is going to allow this niche partitioning, <clears throat> which prevents competitive exclusion because each organism is in its own realized niche, which mitigates the amount of competition that's really going on. So this is why we have a more complex environment is going to be more biodiverse. Uh, take, for example, we have a... Uh, I've been building this little... Uh, garden area outside of my window here, and what we had is we had just grass, and this uh, flat grass with relatively even sunlight, even soil chemistry, and about the same water availability throughout could provide uh, just, well, you can have grass, you can have cat's ear, you can have plantain, you can have clover, okay? Not many plant species going on there. But if I were to have, you know, certain ferns and hosta and uh, Oregon grape and hydrangea. Well, you can see how this more diverse environment with more diverse niches. You can kind of picture an uneven distribution of resources because you have some herbs that can be eaten by some herbivores and some plants that simply cannot. You have berries, you have flowers. This kind of uneven resources is going to mean more niches. So picture St. Martin's, you know, as a landscape of rolling hills, you have places where there's more water, you have places where there's more uh, nitrogen, and this is going to mean uneven resources in which nit nitrogen-loving plants, nitrogen-needing plants, need a lot of water, are going to be found in these valleys with high nitrogen, and valleys with low nitrogen is going to have water-loving, nitrogen-less-needing plants. Picture St. Martin's without plants, and how many niches do you see? Picture St. Martin's when you add the plants, and how many different plants you have. You have uh, niches where the Masama pocket gopher can live. You have an area where the deer can live. You have all these added niches as you add more plant species. And when you add more animals, you're going to add even more niches. So now that we have Masama pocket gopher, we have deer, we have rabbits. Now we can be introducing hawks. We can be introducing coyotes. If we have a larger, uh, larger lakes, actually we do have a, a large enough lake that we do have a beaver or two. If we had larger lakes, you get more fish, which would introduce bald eagles. As you see more and more niches, the more complex 
the environment is. And don't forget as well about parasites and pollinators, each of which has their own niche on various animals or on various flowers. We're looking at this biodiversity here in two different deserts. And what you see is we have perhaps a cause of the different levels of biodiversity. Why do we have uh, the Sonora Desert and the Mojave Desert are very different levels of biodiversity as in the picture right here. We have one with Oregon pipe cactus and I um, don't know what the yellow flowers are, but they're kind of pretty. So those are absent though in this creosote plain. So think about some causes here. Think about the rainfall, of course. Think about the soil chemistry, the relative drainage, uh, the relative temperature, all these different abiotic factors bringing different levels of biodiversity. And think about the effects as well. I think from the term, uh, from the picture of a bat flying over this, when you have Sahara cacti, as you have in the background of this one more biodiverse desert, that's going to be a place for them to pollinate. The bats flying over can pollinate the flowers, as well as a source of fruit. So adding more biodiversity adds more biodiversity. So that's going to be one of the key factors we're going to be like kind of looking at here. The more species you add, the more niches you add because species interact with species. So how do we see it? Well, we see it at different levels. We're going to think about how do we, as ecologists, interact with biodiversity. Are we looking at a single forest? Are we looking at a landscape? Are we looking at the biodiversity of a whole state? Or are we looking at the biodiversity of maybe even a whole biome? <coughs> so your alpha diversity is your species richness in a single community. So we look at, say, um, the community uh, Lois Lake, and St. Martin's, that forest. That forest, we'd look at the alpha diversity. We could as well look at the beta diversity if you were looking at the forest at St. Martin's, uh, looking at the forest, one of the forests on JBLM, and looking at one of the forests in the, um, in the community at the southern edge of the Hood Canal or something. So they, they have three different uh, Douglas fir dominating forests, that dominated forests, with a beta diversity, we're looking at the species diversity in three communities. However, looking at this on more of a landscape scale, when you consider the species diversity, not only in several distinct forests, but everywhere from capital forests on the on the west and um, the kind of mountain divide right there, and all the way to the Cascades, north to Kitsap Peninsula, south to uh, Chehalis, that'd be your landscape scale gamma diversity. So seeing this at different levels, a higher and higher, um, well, lower and lower magnification, I guess. And we're going to look at, uh, we're going to define diversity in two ways here, which is going to be the species richness and the species evenness. And this is one of those like making a park versus making an ecosystem kind of questions. All right, so species richness is just how many species are there. So if we're looking at St. Martin's, we're actually going to see quite a few examples where there is one species on campus because uh, the monks actually planted a lot of gardens on campus. But a lot of these gardens, you just have a specimen of something, like singular. This is one plant. It's uh, just next to a chicken coop, just... Uh, east of St. Martin's uh, old main building. And this this plant, it's some sort of tree, and I never figured out what species it is because I've never seen it before in my life. And there's exactly one of them I've ever seen in my life, and it's here on campus. A single one of those. That adds to species richness. Planting uh, one metasequoia would add to the species richness. So St. Martin's is a great species richness because we have so many, like, single-time planting. We have a very few metasequoia plants. We've got a lot of incense cedars planted, but we don't really have much in the way of evenness on campus. Evenness is when we're going to uh, have, you know, five of each species, five each of four species in a forest would be completely even. You know full well that St. Martin's does not have a very species even community. You look at it, you're like, can I take a look at any part of any part of campus that has trees and not see a Douglas fir? No, the evenness is completely skewed and dominated by that single species, which is why it's been in like all of my lectures, because I have no intent of species evenness through the lectures, because there's no species evenness on campus. That domination by single species isn't always a bad thing, 
but a higher species richness is going to ensure this more um, more even use of resources. So I want you to consider the role of succession in increasing and diver decreasing diversity. If you were to, you know, just have humans go on a uh, two millennium hiatus from campus and just disappear for a while, you'll see the Douglas fir forest turn into a hemlock and um, cedar forest, which may or may not end up going more into a spruce forest. Probably, probably not. Probably more cedar and hemlock. But the cedar and hemlock would start dominating, and you'd have the Douglas fir kind of um, not really dominating, but still present. Uh, the incense cedars would dominate certain parts of campus. The big leaf maples would dominate others. The, the alders would be present in others. The yews, the unfortunately hollies. It would actually go towards more uh, evenness, but some species would slowly go extinct. So the holly might get outcompeted. Uh, the scotch broom would just get gone because that doesn't really have a long-term plan here. So some species would go extinct as succession occurs, which is going to mean there's this increase in diversity but then it decreased as the most competent, best suited species outcompete everything else. In two millennia, if you came back, you might actually see, you'd, you'd definitely see a lower species richness, and you'd probably see a higher species evenness in our ecosystem. We can calculate these two things using what's called the Shannon Wiener Biodiversity Index. So the Shannon Wiener Biodiversity Index is going to measure the relative proportions of each species. So I'm going to actually do it this way. We're going to look at proportions, and then I'm going to show you the equation. So you have, let's see, you have two, these two communities, community A and community B. They both have equal richness, but they have very different evenness. You have five species, 25 individuals total. In community A, you can look at there's 21 of species one and then one each of the other four species. This means the proportion of species A is about 84, you know, 0.84. So to calculate the Shannon Wiener Biodiversity Index, you're going to take the log, uh, the natural log, of, um, of, the, of the proportion. So you take the proportion, the natural log of the proportion, and you multiply those two together, and then you add it up for all five species. So what we can see is the first community, community A, has this natural log of the proportion times the natural log of the proportion is going to be very skewed towards that first species, whereas the other one is going to be more evenly distributed so all the species are the same. We're going to add these up and get different uh, Shannon Wiener biodiversity indices. One's going to be that 0.662, which is a low biodiversity, and the other is 1.610, which is a higher biodiversity. So you can see how the evenness, the change in evenness, has resulted in a higher biodiversity index. Let's take a closer look at that calculation there. Tough than I thought. Okay. So here's the calculation. That's going to be H equals the negative sum from A equals 1 to S of P sub so, so I, natural log. The proportion times the natural log of the proportion for each individual from I equals 1 to S, where S is your total number of species. This is going to end up being a negative number because the natural log of something less than one is going to be a negative number. So you multiply this whole thing by this negative modifier here. And that's your total biodiversity at a site. So that's your H. A higher H value is a more biodiverse site. Lower H value is a less biodiverse site. There you have it. When looking at this, we're going to see differences in abundance. Most species, as you remember, are uncommon. So remember these seven forms of rarity. Most species are uncommon. Only you have to have three out of three good traits to make for a common species. So this means is that most species are moderately abundant. The abundance here just, if I were to capture 300,000 night uh, flying pollinators, What's this going to look like? So 
we're going to get something called a log normal distribution. So let's say I captured 87,000 moths. And you're going to find you have over 8,000 are one species. That's that most common species. That's the has the three forms of being common. Good. And then like 5,583 are going to be the next species. So really dominated by these two species. Well, we see that there are less and less of these other ones. And we have a lot of species, we have like two to eight of them. And we plot this on a log scale on the x-axis. And as far as the number of species that have that number of individuals, we plot that on a normal scale on the y-axis. And that's how we get the log normal distribution. So for 87,000 moths, we have a lot of species that are relative, that are pretty uncommon. Some are very rare. And then one or two that just absolutely dominate the collection. Well, if we were to move it up to 300,000 moths, we now have some species we didn't see before, but we still have that incredibly common species. So those incredibly common two species are still going to dominate, of course. But the more we collect, the more we start to see a few species are relatively, um, sorry, most species are relatively uncommon. A few species are incredibly rare, and a few species are incredibly common. That's going to lead to this log normal distribution, whereas you see the other side with the percent cover of this hypothetical uh, plant species, you have few, sp few species have very low cover, few species have very high cover, most species have moderate cover. So that's going to be this log normal distribution is the effect of the seven forms of, ra uh, seven forms of rarity. Remember, all three forms being making the organism common is you need three out of three. You need three out of three to be very rare as well. But in the middle where you have one or two of those three make them common or make them rare, that's actually going to be most species. And it's much easier to find more common species. So think about if you were just look at, you know, look for one species, you're going to see, you know, you're going to see the most common one, of course. And it's like Zubat phenomena is like what I, what I call this. So you, you get... If you go around uh, the Pokemon world, you're going to see Zubats everywhere. There's just tons of Zubats. That's your most common species. You might never see a Missing No, or you might never see a Mew. It's very rare species. You may never see um, a Rhydons. You may see very few Rhydons, but plenty of Rhydhorns, or vice versa. I don't remember. Anyway, the, the very common species are very, well, common because you'll see them everywhere. You're going to get a large sample of that. And certain rare species just may never be seen. You might never see dormant seeds or seasonal species or migratory species or very cryptic species that you're missing. So we might just never sample the bottom of that curve. Even with 300,000 moths, you see the log global distribution, you don't see it tail off. If you were to collect 3 million moths, you'd probably see it tail off a little more and then a little more. Because a log global distribution requires a logarithmic increase in size to actually see everything. Rank abundance curves. So that's where we have uh, the abundance rank on the x-axis and the proportional abundance of the y-axis. And the y-axis here is logarithmic. So again, you see this logarithmic thing. Uh, a rank abundance curve is going to show a community. So community A, remember that had 21 of one species and uh, or tw 20, yeah, 21 of one species and one each of other four species. Uh, that's what you see right here. Your relative rank abundance of the proportion is 0.84 for that first species and then down for the rest of them, whereas this uh, other one is about like 0.32 uh, or something, uh, 0.2. Yeah, 0.2. So that's going to be rank abundance is going to be equal by that greater evenness. So the slope of the rank abundance curve indicates evenness. A higher, a uh, more steep slope is a less even community. So that can actually change. You can look at this soil fertility index. Actually, this is interesting. And so the more you fertilize a soil, you have fewer and fewer species are able to actually dominate that. So the rank abundance curve increases in slope, as you see there, because what you're doing is three species are able to dominate and the other species go extinct. So you start with this, how many species is that? Like 20 something? Oh, 19, 49. Ha. You have 49 species to start with in 1856. And after nearly a century of fertilization, 
Um, 46 of those species have gone extinct because three are completely dominating, which means it's very steep slope where you have, you know, one is almost 100% of the community and you see a few of these others. And that's because what you've done is you decreased the complexity of the niche by evening out the amount of fertilizer and allowing whatever can utilize that fertilizer to be um, most common. So highest number of species is actually lower soil fertility. So fertilizer is bad for biodiversity, which is why it's so great for crops. You're making for a less complex environment. So think about a very large wheat field. It's horizon to horizon. It's flat. It's got equal amounts of water. It's got equal amounts of fertilizer. The soil is the same throughout. You have a single species. This is a rank abundance, not curve at all. Rank abundance data point. So what happens there is we want just wheat. So we get just one species. We annihilate biodiversity when we farm. You can consider how bad that actually goes for you know, other organisms, but it's great if you just want wheat. So the more complex environment is going to have more niches. Here, what we've done by plowing and fertilizing and watering is eliminate niches. And remember, plant biodiversity will beget animal biodiversity. Wheat is a wind-pollinated species. So that huge horizon-to-horizon wheat field has zero pollinators. Yeah. And if we use herbicide, it has zero herbivores. So we stop here at the, um, at the first trophic level. On the other hand, you have more complex environments in different tree sizes. Uh, the volume of foliage above six meters here can be taken as a level of how many niches you have. The more foliage above six meters, what you're going to have is thicker branches. When you have thicker branches, you can have more nests, you can have more lichens, you can have more mosses, you can have a whole bunch of more species. Biodiversity begets biodiversity, but also the simple size of the first trophic level is going to mean more resources are available. So big trees beget more warbler biodiversity by increasing the environmental complexity and the number of niches available. The bigger trees uh, are just, well, you can they're, they're thicker. So you can have more of the outside, uh, the species that lives only on the outside, or the species that lives two meters in, or the species that requires big trunks or something like that. And that's just warblers. Think about how many woodpeckers can now live in large bowls. Think about possums hanging out in the branches. Think about squirrels making their nests. The more foliage that you have, the more environmental complexity you have, and therefore the more species are going to be able to really uh, survive here. So big forests are very good for bird diversity. What about plants? Well, a more complex variety and concentration of nitrogen and silicate is actually going to change the, uh, the plant diversity. So having different nutrient ratios, having this complex landscape is going to allow certain species to dominate in low nutrient, like, well, scotch broom loves low nitrogen, high phosphorus. Um, Douglas fir, it can enjoy, you know, medium nitrogen, high phosphorus. So you have the levels of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and if those are variable throughout the landscape, you're going to get a variable uh, distribution of plants because certain ones can have more, uh, more water, more nitrogen, more silicates, and they specialize in these niches. There's another niche to talk about, and that's the, distur the niche of disturbance. So disturbance is going to add a temporal niche. When I say temporal niche, what you're really thinking is some species are going to do best in a recent tree fall. So some species are going to do best when there has been no disturbance. They're going to be the best competitors are eventually going to dominate a community. So biodiversity is going to peak at a certain point. If there's too much disturbance, then your ruderal species are going to dominate. If there's too little disturbance, then your competitive species are going to dominate. So remember that uh, uh, grapes, uh, grimes, grimes plant, the different types of plants, the ruderals can't live in an undisturbed community for very long. So there's going to be some point where there's maximal amount of uh, 
the maximal amount of um, niches open. So we're going to add niches with this change. <clears throat> if there's in, if there is a certain amount of disturbance, a tree falls. Okay, cool. Now you've added niches for decomposing fungi on the tree. Great. You've added a certain amount of sunlight in that spot in the forest, so now something can grow up very quickly in that open sunlight niche. You have more weeds that can grow there. So you have these niches, and then about 20 years after that tree fall, now you have this dappled sunlight. Now you have this um, partial canopy, and that's going to be another series of niches over time. So you're going to be adding these uh, temporally. And this is where you're going to get what's called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. And I love how this is tested. The hypothesis here is that if you have too many disturbances, too frequent and high intensity of disturbances, you're going to have root rules because they like disturbance. You're not going to have this high competitive, long lived species. You're going to have R selected root rules at very frequent high disturbances. Um, and then you're going to have at the very infrequent disturbance, you have those very high competitive species that are going to be doing best um, under conditions of don't bother me for two millennia, just let me have my niche. So they're going to swamp out a lot of others. But in the middle, you're going to have a combination of those. So some species haven't been disturbed. Some individuals have been disturbed in a thousand years. Some individuals <coughs> just germinated last week. So... The intermediate there is where you're going to find the highest diversity. Well, how do you test that? Well, you go to the uh, the rocks and the beach. So small rocks are turned over very often during winter storms. Very large rocks are not turned over. And the way this was tested is this, this dude. I love referring to great scientific minds as this dude. But he took a spring and attached it to the back of his truck. And the spring could measure how much weight, how much force it took to turn over a rock. So he tied his truck to the spring, uh, to, tied the string, spring to a medium sized, to a small rock and would pull it and measure how much force it took to turn the rock over. And that's how frequently that rock would be disturbed by a crashing wave. He tied this to medium rocks, he tied it to large rocks, and he got the rock relative rock disturbance ability. So how 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 able would wave be to crash over and smash this rock and move it over? So he, then he went, well, actually probably before, but he measured how many organisms were living on that rock, how many different species were on that rock, measured the biodiversity of each rock, and found small rocks have relatively low biodiversity. They've got species that can recolonize every time the rock is turned over. And huge rocks have relatively low biodiversity because they've got the species that can best compete on that rock. But right in the middle were the rocks with the highest biodiversity because they have in intermediate level of disturbance. This can also be tried. Oh, that was Sousa. That's the, that's the dude, right? Um, this is also tested by a prairie fire. So how often a prairie is burned is going to determine how many species can survive on it. An intermediate level of disturbance yields the best biodiversity. So that's a relative abundance and diversity, a pretty hefty, uh, hefty lecture with a lot of different terms. I, I encourage you to look at the book. The book's got some pretty great stories, and there are some very good publications on this. And Ashley Machieski's paper is actually measuring biodiversity. I think I've posted that. If I haven't posted that by now on the very top of the Moodle page, then feel free to ask me. This is one of the student papers that they worked on the biodiversity in, um, in an urban landscape. So, yeah, go out and count some species, why don't you? I mean, or go count Pokemon. You'll find uh, interesting things in terms of biodiversity.